그럼 지금부터 세 번째 기조, 기조 세션을 시작하도록 하겠습니다. 이번 세션은 호주 대사관 주간 세션으로 호주 대학들의 다양한 인재 육성법이라는 주제로 진행되겠습니다. 자장으로는 리처드 포가티 호주 대사관 교육 과학 담당 참사관님께서 수고해 주시겠습니다. 리처드 참사관님 진행 부탁드립니다. Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Welcome to Plenary Session 3, Australian Universities and the Graduates of Tomorrow. I'm Richard Fogarty, Councillor Education and Science at the Australian Embassy in Seoul. Today's session will explore Australian universities' approaches to ensuring that Australian graduates can meet and exceed the demands of employers today and into the future. First, I'll provide a brief outline of the key themes of this session. The rapid rise of the economies of the Asia-Pacific poses new demands for employers in this region. Both public and private sector employers are seeking high levels of adaptability and innovation in their new recruits. Graduates are expected to be able to successfully deal with complex and far-ranging socioeconomic issues, in particular around global value chains, manufacturing, and services across a broad range of markets. Australia's top universities provide graduates whose key attributes in areas including critical thinking, flexibility, and the capacity to innovate readily meet employer goals and objectives. Home to some of the most internationalized classrooms in the world, leading Australian universities provide unique approaches to curriculum that focus on the needs of employers and are reflected in a continuing reputation for excellence in higher education rankings profiles. The core research strengths at Australia's top universities align with key regional export sectors. These strengths, coupled with Australia's special place in the Asia-Pacific region and its national commitment to develop high standards of Asia literacy through its education systems, provide graduates of top Australian universities with a major advantage over their competitors in developing successful careers in the Asia-Pacific region. In this session, leaders from some of Australia's highest ranked universities will explore the strengths of Australian higher education and the range of factors contributing to the achievement of world-leading graduate attributes and outcomes. Specifically, the panel will address the quality markers of Australia's top institutions and the advantages of their unique depth and breadth curriculum models to improving graduate skills and capabilities, the highly internationalised and diverse classroom setting of Australian institutions, and the benefits this has for graduates and employers alike. How Australia's research strengths and key industry partnerships align with sectors in the Asia Pacific region, with examples drawn from Korean industry. How Australian universities are working to leverage the diversity of their staff to drive creation of world leading teaching and student experiences. How Australian government policy settings have encouraged the development of graduates who understand and actively engage with the Asia Pacific region including through key initiatives such as the Asian Century White Paper and New Colombo Plan, and how core Australian university graduate attributes can benefit employers in the Asia Pacific. It is my pleasure to be here today and to be joined by four distinguished speakers who are the leaders of some of Australia's most highly regarded universities, and I'd now like to introduce them to you. We're joined today by Professor Margaret Scheel, Provost of the University of Melbourne, Professor Paul Johnson, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Western Australia. Mr. David Ward, the Vice-President for Human Resources of the University of New South Wales. And Professor Tyrone Carlin, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Registrar of the University of Sydney. Please make the panel very welcome. The universities represented here today are members of the Group of Eight, and I would like to say something briefly about this grouping of Australian institutions. The Group of Eight comprises Australia's eight leading research universities. The University of Melbourne, the Australian National University, the University of Sydney, the University of Queensland, the University of Western Australia, the University of Adelaide, Monash University, and UNSW Australia. In world rankings, Group of Eight universities are consistently the highest ranked Australian universities. All Group of Eight member universities are ranked in the top 200 institutions worldwide in the academic ranking of world universities from Shanghai Jiao Tong University, the Times Higher Education World Rankings, and the QS World University Rankings. The QS University Rankings by subject 
rate all Group of Eight law schools in the top 100, with six in the top 50 and four in the top 20. All Group of Eight universities have at least one field of engineering ranked in the top QS 100, and all are in the top 100 for medicine, psychology, and education. Each year, the Group of Eight spends some $6 billion on research, more than $2 billion of which is spent on medical and health services research. I'd like to speak a little about the format for today's presentation. Each of the speakers will present for 15 minutes, and we'll have time for questions at the end of the session. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Margaret Scheel, Provost of the University of Melbourne. Professor Scheel has been Provost of the University of Melbourne since April 2012, and prior to this appointment, she was Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Research Council from 2007 to 2012. She held the position of Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research at the University of Wollongong from 2002 to 2007, and the roles of Professor of Chemistry and Dean of Science at the University of Wollongong during the period 2000 to 2007. She also held a position as postdoctoral fellow at the University of Utah, 1998 to 1999. Professor Sheil got her, gained her PhD in physical chemistry and a Bachelor of Science with honours at the University of New South Wales. Please join me in welcoming Professor Margaret Sheil. So thank you very much, uh, Richard, and thank you very much to the organisers for the opportunity to present here today. I'm going to start by uh, talking about how we've reformed our institution and our institutional environment to create uh, and nurture global talent. And I'm going to do that in the context of some of our reform challenges and also uh, challenges and the opportunities that they presented for our students and for our staff. So the University of Melbourne was founded in 19, 1853 and with a motto that was derived from a poet, poem by Horace, an ancient uh, poet. And that motto translates to, we seek to grow in the esteem of future generations. And so that, that theme of growing the esteem of our institutions and, and adding esteem to our students, and then in turn students adding esteem to our institution, underpins the core of our, our strategy. And indeed, we refer to the str strategic uh, focus of the university as, as the growing esteem strategy. It's had three iterations uh, under the leadership of our current president and vice-chancellor, uh, Glyn Davis, starting in 1985. And each of those three iterations has been underpinned by a major reform of the institution. The first being one which was initiated just after the vice-chancellor arrived in 2005 and uh, was fully adopted in 2008. And this was a major reform of our curriculum. We uh, undertook, uh, uh, the university undertook a program whereby we took 96 specialist undergraduate degrees and uh, replaced them with six broad-based undergraduate degrees and a range of professional programs. So prior to this reform, we had uh, typically uh, students chose straight out of school which course they wanted to do. So they would go straight from high school into medicine or to law and often doing some kind of combination between a Bachelor of Arts, for example, and a law degree or engineering and business. After this reform, uh, the, the pathway to graduate training at Melbourne became doing a broad-based undergraduate degree first and then a graduate professional program. We had been part way along this journey with uh, a number of other Australian universities moving medicine, for example, to the graduate program and, and some universities had introduced Juris Doctors or, 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 or um, graduate law degrees. But in this uh, reform, we undertook to review all aspects of our curriculum and create this new uh, way of, of organising ourselves and, and organising the way that in which students studied at the university. In part, the rationale was to create a different kind of graduate so that students were exposed early to a broad range of opportunities. They didn't have to choose so, uh, so soon at what they wanted to do. There, were many, there are many pathways for students to take through this model. We also uh, involved uh, a requirement that the students study breadth, so something outside their own discipline. So 
we encourage, and we've heard a lot about this at this conference, the need to encourage disciplinary depth and, uh, and graduates and, and uh, employers to think more broadly. And so the Melbourne curriculum uh, lends itself to that. We also then, in that process, undertook uh, to aim, or aim to change our student body from being 80 to 90 per cent undergraduate to 50-50 graduate and undergraduate. And uh, seven years on, we've, we've managed to achieve that. One, one aspect of, the pro of this uh, curriculum reform, w w part of it was changing the way in which uh, our students undertook their courses, but another aspect of it, which we, we don't talk about quite so often, but was equally important, is it's changed dramatically the way in which students can access the University of Melbourne. So prior to the introduction of the curriculum reform, if you wanted to do medicine at our university, you by and large had to get close to 100% in your final high school exam. And similarly into one of our law programs, the requirement and the demand for the university in those programs was so great that you had to have done as well as you, as well as you could possibly could becoming in the top 1% of students to enter those programs. With this change, our students can enter, enter the University of Melbourne with an average of 90% in their high school program and then from that point on study hard and get into the graduate, the prestige graduate programs. And we know that that changes access dramatically because prior to, uh, in order to get that sort of very top high school score, students have to have the right school, often our, our, the parents of uh, invest in a, in a private education, in tutorials that we heard of earlier today as the parentocracy. So the parent investment and the school investment as much as the student ability was determining the entry. So this has been a major change and we've also enabled uh, greater access by uh, for different targeted uh, cohorts of students. They can, they can access one of our six programs at, at a lower entry level and then by studying hard during that, that uh, undergraduate program then can access these prestige graduate programs. So that's been very important. The second phase of growing esteem was to invest more heavily in our research. So we had very much the highest quality uh, of, or amongst the highest quality higher education academics in Australia, but we had left behind some of the investment in, in major infrastructure. And so there's nothing too dramatic in this uh, phase of the strategy. We invest he heavily in infrastructure. We partnered with our hospitals and medical research institutes. And we've seen that uh, those key partnerships, both within the hospitals, medical research institutes, and with many global institutions and global companies, has contributed to the increase in our reputation and the quality of our students and the demand for our programs. The third phase, which we've just entered into, uh, was underpinned and focused on engagement with uh, both our industry partners, but with, with also with... Uh, with business, with our alumni, and a whole range of um, various partnerships. And we found, as we were entering this uh, third phase, which was focused on engage engagement, that we really needed to look at the way the university did business with itself. And so we, we, we know that our alumni and our donors were not interested in giving us money to see that we didn't spend it efficiently. We understood that engaging effectively with business required us to be a good business ourselves, to operate in a, in a very effective uh, way. And so we undertook a major administrative reform, which we now call following on from our curriculum reform, which was known as the Melbourne Curriculum Model. We call this major administrative form, reform the Melbourne Operating Model. And we over a period of 18 months, took all our administrative staff and centralised them into a shared services model, took staff from academic divisions and uh, from, from the central administration areas and uh, created a shared service uh, for the university across all the range of services that the university requires. And we did that in order to both uh, improve our service, but also to generate the, the cost savings that we needed to reinvest in our core academic pursuits. And we've done that 
in a much more ambitious way than, than some of the US universities have done this, where you know, Berkeley's taken three to five years to do something that we have done in 18 months. So that's been something of a challenge. So there, the, there have been the three uh, major reforms that have really underpinned the success of the university in the way that we have uh, positioned ourselves both within Australia and internationally. So we've done that and then finally, as we've uh, uh, looked to engage further internationally, we have looked at how we can best uh, encourage our students to both, uh, both engage with other students on the Melbourne campus but also to encourage them to, to move overseas. So we have about 30% of our international student population is, of our student population are international students. The majority of them come from China. We have around 250 Korean students each year. We publish about 200 papers over, over the last four or five years with Korea. But we, we, and we seek to diversify that international population, but we're also at the same time very much trying to ensure that our Australian domestic students and our international students get the benefit of working together. So we seek to encourage them to work in teams, in, uh, in a range of activities that ensure that, that both our Australian students have the cultural competencies to work overseas, but also that our international students get a, 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 a truly uh, international experience in their education. And we're helped by that clearly in the fact that we've got a global uh, city and that many of our students, our Australian students, as we heard in another session, are uh, actually born overseas. So, so we have a, a very multi multicultural uh, community, but it's not very bilingual. So typically, unless your parents speak another language, Australian students uh, don't learn uh, another language. So we're encouraging them by privileging Asian languages in our breadth program and also by encouraging um, uh, the international mo mobility of students. So I'm running short of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish with one other activity that we uh, have just started and is part of the third phase of this uh, strategy, and that is that we know, we share with, we've heard about Korean uh, universities, the issue of uh, graduate employability, and we know that one part of that is encouraging students to uh, make, make their own businesses. So we've heard earlier today and, and, and yesterday about the importance of entrepreneurship and innovation. And we've just introduced that in a range of ways to our curriculum and it's just taken off. It, the, the demand for students to work together to, uh, to do things innovative is much greater than the demand, for example, to do organised teamwork within classes. So we introduced a, an accelerator program for our engineer students two years ago where students have the opportunity to start, a, start up their own company with a, with a small investment from the faculty and we put entrepreneurs from our alumni in, in contact with those students and, and we've started this accelerator program that, that has um, become very successful. It's spread to all the faculties are now investing in this program. The demand for students is huge. And it's interesting when you tell them they have to work together uh, to generate the kind of skills that for the future workforce in working in teams, they don't want to do it. But if you, you tell them that uh, they can create value in this way, they go out and we we're founding, finding that the students are self-organising into the kind of teams that they need to build the businesses that they feel will make money. And we've just, in the last, uh, uh, several days announced a partnership there with Australia's uh, postal company who want to invest in this activity because they know that students that go on to generate online businesses have to have their parcels delivered to, as part of that, that commercial trade and so they see that as an investment in their future. So in summary, uh, I would say that, that the way Melbourne has approached all these reforms is to say that if we're prepared to take risks ourselves at the top and, and, and with our faculty, that we can take the students with us and that the students have a value that experience of working in an institution that is innovative and thinking about the kind of skills that we need to, to operate ourselves and, and therefore uh, the kind of skills and opportunities we generate for our students. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Margaret Scheel. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Johnson, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Western Australia. Professor Johnson has been Vice-Chancellor of the University of Western Australia since 2012, and prior to this, he was Vice-Chancellor and President of La Trobe University in Melbourne. Prior to this appointment, he held a number of roles at the London School of Economics, including as a lecturer in social history, reader in economic history, professor of economic history, and from 2004 to 2007 as deputy director of the London School of Economics. Professor Johnson has published a number of books on the subject of the economic history of the United Kingdom. His bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees were gained at Oxford University. He has been a member of the Advisory Council of the Australian Research Council since 2011 and a director of Group of Eight Universities Australia since 2012. Professor Johnson has advised the World Bank, the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, the UK House of Lords, the UK Government Pension Law Review Committee, among many other consultancies and directorships. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Paul Johnson. I'm going to talk uh, over the next 10 minutes or so about the way in which we attempt to make links between our research in universities and links with industry, and also how that relates to how we undertake some of the work with our students, some of our teaching. Um, in the previous session, um, uh, many of you will have heard uh, Professor Michael Arthur talking about the approach of University College London, where that link between teaching and research is a fundamental part uh, of the UCL vision for the future. And I would say it's also a strong part of uh, what all the group of eight universities uh, endeavor to do uh, in Australia. But let me begin by saying a little bit about my own university, uh, the University of Western Australia, uh, which is located in Perth in Australia. You may not all know where Perth is, so I thought I'd, uh, I would show you with a red dot. We've had two earlier red dots today. Um, uh, former Prime Minister Goh of Singapore pointed out that uh, Singapore was often described as a, a red dot on the map, and Peter Zeck was talking about red dot designs. Um, but uh, I uh, want to point out where Perth is. It's the red dot on this particular map on the western side of uh, Australia. The important thing about this, though, are the blue lines. Um, at the University of Western Australia, we run a conference. Uh, we have done for the last five years. It's called the In the Zone Conference. And it's about looking north in the time zone, plus or minus two hours from the Perth time zone. In the territory, inside those blue lines, live 60% of the world's population. So universities, companies, governments, and societies within those blue lines are, have, have the opportunity to play a major role over the next 50 years in the economic, social, political, and cultural development of the world. This is where the action will be happening. We're all very privileged to be living there, but we have responsibilities to make use of the opportunities uh, that come from that. Perth is a city of two million people. Um, it's a very dynamic city. Uh, again, in the uh, previous session, uh, uh, Professor John Sexton from NYU was talking about how dynamic New York City is. 40% of the population in New York City are migrants. 40% of the population in Perth are migrants. 39% of the population in Sydney are migrants. 37% of the population in Melbourne are migrants. We live in Australia in a very cosmopolitan and a very dynamic uh, urban uh, environment. So in Australia, uh, we recognize that our place in the world in this very dynamic time zone, and Australia as a migrant receiving country, as a very dynamic uh, place, uh, has uh, huge opportunities. And within the university system, we try to build on those opportunities. My university, the University of Western Australia, is itself um, very cosmopolitan. 49% of the academic staff are from countries other than Australia. 22% um, of our undergraduates have some opportunity to study abroad, study overseas, whilst they're uh, at the University of, Aust uh, of Western Australia. Um, over 25% of our undergraduates now study a language. Uh, even though languages are not, uh, I would say, well taught throughout uh, uh, the Australian education system, 25% of our undergraduates uh, study 
a language. Um, uh, around 600 of the UWA undergraduates study Korean. In fact, we have three of them uh, in this auditorium uh, this afternoon taking double majors uh, in astrophysics and Korean, in communication studies and Korean, in mathematics and Korean. So we are always looking for the opportunities to bridge across disciplinary boundaries and provide opportunities, in this case, opportunities to study Korean language and culture as well as more traditional academic uh, disciplines. And we have to do this because Australia is a very, very open economy. Uh, we have to trade with the rest of the world to survive. Uh, and we have to make sure that we have the capacity within Australia in terms of human capital and the connections with the rest of the world to sustain that trading position. We also, of course, uh, have challenges because within universities, typically we work within boundaries, disciplinary boundaries, physics, chemistry, biology, economics, medicine, boundaries that have existed for a long time. In fact, many of them we've inherited from the late 19th century. And we often educate students within these boundaries. Yet we know industry and government want flexible workers who, as well as being skilled in their particular area of expertise, uh, are also um, able to work across disciplines, who have curiosity to look uh, elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, that is a challenge for every university. Uh, though we all wish to achieve great things in research uh, areas, um, research rankings are themselves guided and defined by disciplinary boundaries. There is no Nobel Prize for interdisciplinary studies. Um, so how do we go about this? Well, we do, um, uh, we, uh, do various things. I should just say at, at the University of Western Australia here some statistics. We're a mid-sized university, just under 25,000 students, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, just over 2,000 uh, academic staff, and uh, 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 ranked uh, in the world top 100 universities uh, in terms of uh, our research. Um, what do we do to drive that research and to make it relevant to industry? We, um, we try to link the research with the teaching and we try to link the research with industry. So we try to build across that continuum. Let me give you just a few little examples of uh, what we've been doing. Uh, Western Australia is one of the uh, richest um, mineral uh, deposit areas in the world. Uh, Western Australia um, uh, accounts for around, uh, well, Western Australia is the world's largest exporter of iron ore, and from the middle of next year, it will be the world's largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. It will, will take over from Qatar, which is currently the major exporter of national ga natural gas. So, of course, as a university, we work very closely with the energy and mineral sector. Uh, and the, uh, the picture on the, the, the top left, uh, you can see there, uh, is one piece of scientific work that we've been doing for 10 years now with the company Rio Tinto, the mining company. And that is, in fact, a, a, um, an, uh, the, the equipment there is a, an airborne uh, gravity gradiometer, which we've been developing with Rio Tinto. You put this uh, device up in a plane, you fly it at relatively low altitudes over the land, and it does very high-speed, large-scale mapping of subterranean mineral deposits, something that hitherto would have to be done manually by teams going out and plodding their way uh, across the land. Now, that is something that's been put together by physicists, mathematicians, engineers, geologists, and geoscientists. It's not a piece of research that could be done from within one discipline, and it's not research that could be done just by a university. It needs the engagement with industry uh, uh, to undertake uh, that sort of work. Um, in agriculture, uh, Western Australia is a major agriculture export area, very important for Korea because uh, Western Australian wheat is the principal source of Korean udon noodles. Uh, so uh, we have a major role in, in, to play in, in Korean society. Uh, but Western Australian agricultural uh, scientists um, who are experts in dry land agriculture, it's a very arid, dry um, area, have been doing a lot of work uh, to improve uh, agricultural productivity. But it's not just agricultural scientists, it's geneticists, economists, engineers, uh, as well as uh, agronomists. 
Uh, one of the uh, um, things that we also do is focus very much on the ocean. Uh, Western Australia has 12,000 kilometers of pristine coastline on the Indian Ocean, full of lots of sharks. And uh, in Western Australia, we love the beaches, we love going to, 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 uh, to swim in the ocean, uh, but we're all, all a little scared of sharks. We have been doing a lot of work on how sharks behave. Now, it's difficult to do research on sharks. If you ask them a question, they bite you. So you have to be very smart as scientists to uh, get information. So we've been doing work uh, in neurobiology. It's a combination of neuroscientists uh, and biologists looking at how sharks, um, how shark sensory systems develop. And again, in the top, um, the top left-hand corner here, you can see a, a couple of surfers carrying, wearing strangely colored wetsuits and carrying a striped um, surfboard. These are experimental wetsuits and, and uh, surfboards that have been designed to confuse the visual system of sharks so that instead of attacking um, these surfers on their surfboards, they will go and uh, eat seals or dolphins or uh, their natural prey. And we do a lot of research in, in medicine. Uh, on the right, uh, um, uh, major development in, in using MRI imaging to uh, detect iron in the liver to, to um, uh, deal with um, uh, uh, a, a major disease called hemo hematomacrosis, um, uh, developed by physicists and medics. And uh, on the left, the world's smallest microscope. So this is a microscope that's in a hypodermic needle developed by um, in collaboration between surgeons, oncologists, engineers, and microscopists, which is used to identify single, visually identi identify single cancerous cells in a tumor. So it's a very, very high-powered microscope that can be just inserted uh, into tumors. So all the time we're working with the users, the end users, uh, surgeons, medics, agriculturalists, engineers, uh, mining companies, oil companies, uh, to link our research uh, to make it relevant. And we take that back through to the students who also are studying uh, in res a research-led uh, environment. So we have lots of partners, and this is true of each one of the group of eight universities. We have a huge number of industry partners with whom we work, and it's a close and symbiotic uh, uh, relationship. And from that, of course, a whole range of spin-out companies as we try to develop and do our part to develop an innovative and dynamic economy uh, throughout uh, Australia. And we've been doing a little bit of this in terms of from the University of Western Australia in terms of joint research uh, with Korea, particularly focused around uh, both our expertise in uh, offshore and ocean bed engineering uh, and also in oil and gas uh, processing. So. Um, uh, let me just conclude by saying uh, this is attempted to give you a snapshot of how the Australian university system links up very closely with industry. We need to do that because we have to address the needs of industry. Universities are the key production units for the next generation of skilled workers of human capital. And if we don't take account of what industry requires, they require the skills, the depth, but also the breadth and flexibility then we won't be playing our part in generating the innovative economy of tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Johnson. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. David Ward, Vice President of Human Resources for UNSW. Since February 2008, Mr. Ward has led a team of HR practitioners providing operational, advisory, and strategic advice and support to enable UNSW to meet its teaching, research, and community engagement activities. Prior to this appointment, as Deputy Director of Human Resources, David held senior management responsibility for employee relations, occupational health and safety, workers' compensation, and generalist HR support. Since 2014, he's held the position of Chair of the Group of Eight Universities HR Directors Group. Please join me now in welcoming Mr. David Ward. Today I'm going to talk about what is a very significant feature of, the, of Australian universities, and that is their diversity. As we've heard already in this conference, talent does not reside in any one group. Talent is, is, is very diverse. To succeed, organisations need to embrace and leverage that diversity as a way of enabling our people to be all that they can be. 
Australia's top universities recognise the value that diversity brings. It brings a richness to our e education experience, both inside the classroom, but also in the life of the campus. It also significantly enhances our research. Teams of, of people with diverse skills working together to create ideas and, and as a way of fostering innovative thinking. We very much see the benefit of exposing our students and also our staff to very different world views. Universities in Australia embrace multiple dimensions of diversity, cultural diversity, gender, sexual identity, socio-economic status and age. In my presentation today, I'm going to talk about two of those dimensions, cultural diversity and gender diversity. Both Paul and Margaret have already touched on, on, on the very diverse nature of uh, the student population in Australia from an international student point of view. I've got a couple of charts here that, that really, that really emphasise that. There's approximately 1.3 million students in Australia, 25% of which are international students. So a very large number there. But interestingly, 17, another 17% are domestic st students so, i.e. Australian students who were born overseas. So that's 42% of the student population born outside of Australia. You can also see from the chart on the right-hand side that 16% of those domestic students speak a language other than English at home. So very much a highly internationalised student population which brings a very rich dimension of cultural diversity. There's also an interesting story around gender. The chart on the left-hand side shows that 58% of domestic students in Australia are women. While there's slightly more male international students than female international students, overall 55% of all students in Australia are women. When you look at the chart on the right-hand side, you can see that there's some concentration of areas where, where there's um, very much um, female predominance, areas and disciplines like education, health, humanities, society and culture and creative arts. And then on the, on the far right hand side you can see that there's some, um, some disciplines where female students are very much in the minority, architecture and building and in particular information technology and engineering and related technology. So, so very much um, strong female participation across the Australian student population, but you can see that there's um, greater and lesser uh, degrees of that depending on discipline area. So very strong student diversity, and I've talked about gender and, and, and cultural diversity. The benefit that, that we see that that brings for our, for our students, but also for our staff, is that you get multiple perspectives from people from right across the world interacting with each other every day as part of the, the course and the, and the degree programs that they're studying where those multiple perspectives can really enrich the learning environment. It prompts the question, what does our staff profile look like? Does it, does it mirror our student profile? And it's, it's something that universities have been w working very hard on over a number of years bit of data up here around gender diversity within the staffing profile of Australian universities uh, and you can see that the answer to that question of you know does it does it match up with our student profile is is yes but also no in some cases so the chart on the left hand side shows that very much at those junior academic levels so at the level of associate lecturer and lecturer you can see that there is very close parity there between female staff and male staff. Sorry, I noticed that the heading of this has dropped off. The, the, the chart actually shows the percentage of staff who are female within Australian universities. So that left-hand side shows that at the junior academic levels there is a, a significant parity there. As you get into more senior academic levels, you see that parity starts to drop off. Firstly at the senior lecturer level, but then as you get into the most senior academic levels of associate professor and professor, only about 31% of staff at those levels are women. Now the good news is that you can see from the, from the chart that that has been increasing over the last few years, going back to, to the year 2000 where it was only approximately 16%. So it, it is heading in the right direction, but 
at 31%, there, there's, there is obviously still a significant gap there. Um, and it's a gap that's replicated in the, in the senior leadership ranks of universities, um, which at the risk of alienating my academic colleagues, Today I've, I've called for the purpose of this presentation C-suite office holders. So these are, are people who hold the position of Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor or Deputy Vice-Chancellor in Australian universities. Only 31% of those people are women. So very significant gap there and, and something that universities uh, in Australia are working very hard on because it does represent a significant amount of talent that has been wasted. The good news, as, as I said, though, as you can see from the chart on the left-hand side, is that... Um, it is, it is getting significantly better. So my own university, UNSW Australia, some, some people also know us as the University of New South Wales, uh, we're a very large university by, by world standards, 53,000 students. Uh, of those, 13,500 are international students, so very high proportion there. Um, 6,000 staff, we were established as a university only in 1949. So, so very young by, um, by the standards of some universities, but, but also remarkably successful in that time. Um, Richard talked about some rankings earlier. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick out the ranking that, that presents UNSW in the best light. So the, so the QS rankings of world universities ranks UNSW as 46th in the world. Um, so, you know, very strong success story in, 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 in a relatively short period of time. So in terms of our own diversity profile of our staff and students, you can see some similarities there but also some differences. We have a slightly lower proportion of female staff compared to, the, uh, to other Australian universities being, being under 50%. Um, in some ways that's a reflection of where our strengths are in, in, in terms of our, our various disciplines. Um, I think we have the largest engineering faculty in the country, for instance, um, very strong in IT and computer science um, and also very strong in business and management. As you can see, though, as, as, as you go across, again, those, those junior academic levels of associate lecturer, lecturer, and into senior lecturer, you can see that, that more or less it does drop a little bit at senior lecturer. The, the, the staff profile, both in terms of female participation but also culturally diverse staff, closely resembles what the student population looks like. Of course, it then starts to drop off, particularly in relation to gender at associate professor level, but, but then significantly in both, uh, both in relation to gender and, and also um, cultural diversity at the level of professor. Um, and that is, is something that we recognise as a very significant challenge for us to overcome because it is, it, it is the people at those levels, the senior people within the, the university who are very much setting the tone and the direction of the university. So we had a new Vice-Chancellor commence at the start of this year, Professor Ian Jacobs. Um, and, and he has led a very strong process of engagement and consultation with staff and students around the university strategy for the next 10 years. Um, and it's something that we've, we've put out in the last couple of weeks. It's available on our website for people to have a look at. And diversity plays a very key part in that strategy. The strategy encompasses three broad pillars, academic excellence, social engagement, and global impact. And front and centre of that social engagement agenda is, is around diversity. I've, I've taken out a quote from the, from the strategy document there. Uh, our success by 2025 will have been built upon embracing the diversity and cultural richness of our communities and ensuring that our staff and students can achieve their full potential regardless of their background. It is something that is fundamental to, to our vision as a university over the next 10 years, embracing that diversity and enabling people to come to UNSW and be the best that they can be. So in terms of some of the things that we've been very active in doing in, in relation to diversity uh, in the past and, and focusing in, in particular around, around that cultural diversity of our student population, it is very much about enriching that ed educational experience. You know, recognising that for students at UNSW, it's about having the greatest p potential to benefit from the programs and, and courses that they undertake, regardless of their, of their social or cultural background. Really trying to be, help those students be the best that they can be and get the most out of their, their education at UNSW. So there's two main elements to that. 
One is around support for, st for students, and that encompasses a number of different activities, partly in relation to um, that, that very direct support for students, um, particularly at the time where they come to university um, and in that orientation phase and in the first um, few weeks and months um, of, of, their, of their enrolment, but then over time ensuring that there is access to, you know, to networks and other students that they can engage with, and also importantly, as they near the end of their degree, to, to career options and opportunities there that they can pursue. So that, you know, very strong emphasis on, on providing as much one-to-one -one advice as possible there. We also run a very strong English language program through our Institute of Languages, uh, which is something that um, attracts both uh, students already enrolled in degree programs at UNSW, but also students planning to enrol in degrees, not just at UNSW, but at other Australian universities. And then our learning centre is about building academic skills, be it in essay writing or, or uh, delivering assignments, so that students can, can uh, get the most out of their degree and, and, and perform as best as they can. So, so lots, of, lots of support there. A lot of that is around in, in the classroom activities. There's also support around outside of the classroom. Um, we've invested very heavily in student accommodation over the last few years, um, and we've doubled the number of beds that we have on campus. Uh, one, of our, one of our objectives is, is always to try to ensure that any international undergraduate student who wants a bed on campus can get one. So that's where we put a lot of resources into that to, to, to try to make that happen. So that support for students is very important, but also equipping our staff is, is, is equally important. Trying to ensure that the staff in our university have that maximum, uh, you, know, you know, work hard to, to maximise the inclusion and participation of all of the students in the class, regardless of their background, and, and, and trying to help bring out the best that people can be. So there's workshops that we, that we, that we run for our staff in, in, in terms of um, delivering of their, delivery of their courses. We've also developed extensive guidelines and, and toolkits to, to provide tips and strategies to, to really enhance the teaching experience. So in terms of programs around some of our staff diversity activities, and I've, I've put a fairly busy slide up there to sort of show some of the things that we've been putting in place over the last few years, there has been a very strong emphasis on gender diversity, um, and, and that sort of reflects partly our um, traditional struggles to, to, to see uh, women coming through into some of those senior academic levels. Uh, but there's also external drivers at play, um, you know, being driven from um, at, at the federal government level, um, but also through activities um, that, that organisations right across Australia, corporates, um, are undertaking through, through diversity reporting. So a lot of activity there, a, a lot of initiatives. Um, I guess at the heart of it, and I, I sort of come to the, the bit in the middle there on the circle, um, and there are very much some, some principles that are, that are guiding our current activity and thinking around diversity initiatives. And the first one I've got up there, I think in many ways, is, is, is by far the most important. Courageous leadership we, we see as, as a fundamental driver to, to, to getting the most out of diversity within our organisations and, 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 and to help those, you know, all of our people be the best that they can be. And we talk about courageous leadership as being critical because, you know, like, like with many things in organisations, le leaders are the, are the ones that make it happen. But recognising that, that diversity is hard, it's not straightforward, it, it's, it's about disturbing the status quo and, and that sort of disruptive thinking up there is the second point is something that we really emphasise. Um, but it's about tackling some of those cultural issues, really getting the most out of diversity is about taking risks sometimes. You know, trying things, you're departing from established norms, traditional ways of thinking and recognising that that carries a bit of a risk for leaders sometimes and that you are trying something new and innovative and, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But really making sure that people feel that it's okay to fail and, and for some, you know, to try something that doesn't quite work, but the important thing is to recognise that if it's not working and then correcting the course of action and driving hard to, to, to make something happen. So I've done a lot of work around removing some of those barriers that we've seen as, as problems over the years and that's you know the initiatives and programs that are highlighted there in the green section but 
but really we feel that some of those principles in the middle there um, are, are really what's driving our diversity agenda forward. So I don't stand up here today claiming to have all of the answers and, and, and certainly some of our uh, diversity statistics would look a little bit different if I did, but certainly what, what we have at UNSW and I know that my colleagues at, at, at the other group of eight universities also have is a, is a re resolute commitment to diversity and inclusion um, and that's because of the value that we see that diversity brings, value that we see every day in, in the teaching and the research effort of our, of our universities. Thank you. Thank you very much, David Ward. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Tyrone Carlin, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Registrar of the University of Sydney. Professor Carlin has been the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Sydney since March 2014. Prior to this appointment, he served in a number of senior roles at the University of Sydney, including as Pro Vice-Chancellor Education Operations and as Co-Dean of the University of Sydney Business School. Prior to his appointment at the University of Sydney, he was Dean of Law at Macquarie University. His research interests include the application and operation of good faith requirements and fiduciary obligations in commercial contexts and corporate financial reporting and regulation. Professor Carlin is the author of numerous book chapters relating to financial risk and reporting. He gained his PhD from the Macquarie Graduate School of Management, Bachelor of Commerce and Master of Commerce with Honours from the University of New South Wales, and a Bachelor of Laws with Honours and Master of Laws from the University of Sydney. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tyrone Carlin. Well, thank you very much. And looking around the room, I can tell that uh, what you're all revved up for is, is a very lengthy dissertation from me on the wonders of Australian education, which I intend to give you. Um, before I do that, I just want to acknowledge a few people um, in the room. Um, Ambassador, um, thank you very, very much for your role and uh, Richard and the staff at the Embassy, um, much appreciated. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, my team, um, Rhett and Anne-Marie, thank you for getting me here safely. Um, don't lose sight of me afterwards, I, I'm a bit absent-minded. Um, Ambassador, you know, reflecting on the audience, y you've had a stellar career um, as an ambassador for Australia, but. I hope I won't embarrass um, the three stars um, over yonder um, from UWA um, by saying that it seems to me that if there are um, the best ambassadors in the room for Australian education, I think it would be you guys. Um, and you'd agree with that, Paul, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Um, so if you want to actually confront real students who can tell you what really goes on in Australian classrooms, um, there they are. Um, don't miss that opportunity and I'm sure that um, you'll learn some fascinating things. So I, uh, I came over in a taxi today and this is my very first trip to Korea. And the gentleman who drove me here asked me where I was from. And I said, Australia. And he said, that's great. He said, where in Australia? I said, Sydney. And he got very excited. And he said, Opera House. Harbour Bridge, and I said, University of Sydney, and he kind of looked at me, and uh, luckily he left me in the car, but the reason I said that is I saw a, a really strange statistic just before I left home from Tourism New South Wales, which apparently the University of Sydney campus um, is the fifth most visited destination by visitors to Sydney, and I can attest to this uh, working in the quadrangle, and I wanted to start my remarks today by reflecting on how unlikely that is um, in the historical context of Australia. If you know anything about Australia, then you will know that um, our European settlement, we have a very, very proud and long indigenous history in Australia, but our European settlement was as a result of our friends in England running out of space in their jails. And so they decided that they would send lots of people, convicts, criminals, they would transport them to what is now Sydney. And they did this for decades. And in fact, they didn't stop sending convicts to where I come from, Sydney, until 1842. And a few years after that, in 1850, if you added up the total population of Sydney, there were only 100,000 of us. 
and we were a long, long way away. No smartphones, right? Voyages by sailing ship a long way from London, HQ. So which crazy person decided in those circumstances, in 1850, only a few years after we stopped being a prison, that it would be a really good idea to build a university that has grown to be so beautiful that so many people want to come and visit us and study with us on a hill overlooking the harbour and the city of Sydney. And more than that, Professor Shield talked about the motto of the University of Melbourne before, more than that, our motto, when you translate it from the Latin, effectively says, whatever they can do in Oxford and Cambridge, we can do in Australia. That's pretty bold stuff. And I tell you that because it is directly relevant to what I want to say to you today about what it is like to be at one of Australia's great universities. We have four of them represented here today, all fantastic institutions. And as you heard, I'm an alumnus of another one of them and another one. So um, it's not coincidental um, that we came to be here uh, in, in the way that we are today. There is a very long history in the relatively short history of our country of aspiring to have the very, very best possible in the world by way of education. So that's a little bit about where we came from. And what it tells you is this, and this is the important thing, that we have a passion for excellence and that even though we are a relatively small country by way of population, though, though large by land mass, we really passionately believe that we can be up there with the best in the world and that our obligation to our students is to offer the very best in the world. And that is what you will find when you, when you come to and study at Australian universities. Now, that passion for excellence translates very directly into the kind of thing that our students experience when they come into our classrooms. And again, I'm not talking just about the University of Sydney here, although this is the experience uh, at my institution. One thing that is very particular um, about the leading institutions of Australia is that they are particularly passionate about making their students uncomfortable. And you might think to yourself, gee, that's not a very good service ethic to make your students uncomfortable. But actually, it's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Because if we are going to imbue our students with that capacity for independent thought, creativity, critical analysis, then what we need to do is to take them out of their comfort zone, to give them problems to solve together with students from different disciplines which they haven't thought of before because guess what? That is the rest of your life. And so when you come into our classrooms, what you find is a confrontation with the capacity, the need, a hunger to think critically, to think differently, but also to collaborate, most importantly, with people who come from disciplines other than yours. One of the beautiful things about my institution is we have 16 different faculties. And you can study everything from Sanskrit to accounting and everything in between. And you could even combine accounting and Sanskrit if you wanted to. And maybe you do. I mean, after all, apparently we've got astrophysics and Korean over here. So who knows what combinations um, might tickle the fancy uh, and might excite the synapses and might solve that next big problem that we've got. I've got a reference here to a, a YouTube video. For those of you who've got the presentation later, we we're talking before about entrepreneurship. Sydney uh, started five years ago a program to empower our students across disciplines to start their business. I won't show you the video now for reasons of time, but if you're interested in that entrepreneurial culture, it is alive and well uh, and something that many of our institutions are investing heavily in and growing. Well, you've heard a lot about diversity today. And you can slice up a good set of statistics in lots of different ways, but the way that I've decided to present this to you today is to show you something quite interesting. And I want to refer you at the bottom of that slide to some stats that relate to the United States. We all know, very big country, many, many, many international students go to the US, and I'm sure that that's true here in Korea uh, as well. And you'll notice at the top, Australia. 
And what you might notice is Australia has fewer international students than the United States. That makes sense. A lot more people in the US. But you might also notice that, on average, there is far less participation by international students in the higher education sector in the US than, for example, Australia or the UK. What does that tell you? It tells you that almost by design, when you walk across a campus in Australia, it will not be a coincidence that you encounter someone from a different culture, who speaks a different language, who thinks in a different way to you, who's interested in different things to you, who's had different life experiences. Our universities are configured so that this is just part of the everyday experience. And if you visit an Australian university campus, what you will find is that a very, very substantial proportion of those international students who populate the universities, although they come from literally uh, just about every country on earth, a very substantial proportion, probably three quarters of them, come from our region. And that's important because if you have a look at the economic trade flows, the integration between the economies, the massive population that exists, as Professor Johnson was saying, in this time zone, what you see on Australian university campuses is a microcosm of that. You see campuses which by their nature are drawn from the region, have an understanding of the cultures and the languages of the region, and in turn reflect that back into the learning journey that students go through together so that when we send our graduates out into the world, they actually have a tangible understanding of that world outside of Australia that they will go back out into. And that is so important to us. And it's an important thing for Australia too, because Australia being a small country can't live by looking at itself. Australians are great travellers. Australians have a passion for going out, learning new things, learning new cultures. And you see that reflected very much and very deeply in our campuses. And you see it reflected in the curriculum as well. These three brilliant ambassadors who I was embarrassing before are here in Korea uh, as part of what we call the New Colombo Plan. And that is one of the signature policies of the Australian government to get Australian undergraduate students to come in particular to Asia, to reside in Asia, to learn the language, to learn the culture, to study here. Why are we doing that? We're doing it not because it is expedient. We are doing it because it is a reflection of our values. And so that sort of approach to internationalization and mobility, the idea of looking outwards, is very much a feature of many of the curricula that you encounter uh, at, uh, at Australian universities, particularly in the Group of Eight. Bottom line is, economically, what this does is it provides massive impetus to our economy. We know, you know in Korea, we know in Australia, that the underpinning of growth in living standards is productivity, and if you don't have the capacity to grow productivity, you're nowhere. What we've seen in Australia is substantial labour productivity and multi-factor uh, productivity growth um, over a period of 20 years now. Where's that coming from? It's not an accident. A lot of it is because of the emphasis we place on education. So here is a curious paradox. Big country, small population, 23 million. Only a young country. Nothing of the history of this region, at least in terms of European settlement. And yet, we have seven of the world's top 100 universities in our country. Is that an accident? I would say to you that that is not an accident. I would say to you that that is a reflection of design. That is a reflection of the passion that we have in our higher education system to be the very best we can and to provide the very best experience we can. And it's for that reason that when you come to Australian universities, you'll see amazing things happening. Before I left home, someone put in my hand the prototype of an optical processor, which will be 10,000 times more powerful than any silicon-based processor 
in your smartphone or your computer at the moment. That's being built on my campus. So whether it's a tiny microscope, whether it's shark behaviour, I like that one, whatever it is, you will find these amazing things and more importantly than that, we don't hide our researchers. We actually get the researchers collaborating with our students and indeed at the University of Sydney we've taken that to the extreme of building buildings where the research that is going on is absolutely transparent and permeable to our students because we want our students to see and be excited by and participate in the creation of knowledge. So this is not a coincidence. It's also not a coincidence that Australia uh, features highly uh, in education and human development vectors. Why is that? Well, I've told you, we take this stuff seriously. I think I've got my message through loud and clear there. I'm going to leave you with some things in light of all of this that probably ought not surprise you. We are about leaders. And so every one uh, of the institutions that are represented here and those from the group of eight that aren't um, take very, very great pride in the global and national leaders um, that we've produced. And you can see that Australian universities haven't just produced leaders for Australia. They've produced leaders in many walks of life uh, throughout the world, and not just in education and government, but also in entertainment, including K-pop bands, I'm told. How exciting is that? The thing is, if you want excellence, you have to be able to create the minds and the ideas of tomorrow. And if there's something I'm probably more proud of than anything else, it's the success that we have had as a sector in doing that. If you have a look down this list of Nobel Prize winners, for example, and other very notable contributors to knowledge, you will notice not only the breadth of the different fields of knowledge where Australian researchers have done amazing things over decades, but you will notice the breadth of the institutions from which they come. And that tells you something important. It doesn't matter where you go in our country, you can find a wonderful university. And one thing I hope you understand and, and have a very tangible sense of after listening to all of us today is that our colleagues are absolutely committed not just to that legacy, but to making that the case on an enduring basis for the future. And that is what this is all about. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be here today, uh, and no doubt there'll be some time for Q&A later on. So thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Carlin. Well, thank you very much to our four speakers. Um, I'd like, if I may, to, to pose a few questions which arise from some of the content of your presentations. And the first question I have is on the skills of tomorrow. Um, my question I'd like to, to ask Professor Johnson, if I may. Um, how do institutions identify and prepare graduates for the skills of tomorrow? And I'm also interested in what actions might be undertaken with the communities that universities serve, including employers, to ensure fitness for purpose of both curricula and graduates? Uh, it's been estimated that somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of the jobs that graduates will be going into in seven or eight years' time don't yet exist. So one of the things we can't do in the education system is identify the jobs of tomorrow and then say there is a linear path from inculcating job-specific skills in the education um, uh, uh, in educational institutions, high schools and universities, uh, to prepare those students. So we have to prepare students to be, um, to be engaged with the world of tomorrow. Uh, they, need to be, um, they need to be well trained in their area of expertise. Uh, they need to be critical thinkers. They need to be curious. Um, they will also need to be dissatisfied. Um, I think it's very important that every graduate from every one of our universities is dissatisfied, not with their experience of education, but dissatisfied with the world, because we want our graduates to know that the world can be better. And it's a role of young people to challenge conventions and then 
to undertake actions that will make the world better. Um, it's the energy of young people, the energy of students, the energy of graduates. Um, that's why employers go out and hire new graduates, because they want that innovative um, element. They want that energy uh, to bring in uh, to their companies. So I, I would say, uh, how can we prepare students for the roles of tomorrow? Uh, we need, need to make sure that students are alert to opportunity. If there is, however, one thing that I would say, um, we, every graduate of today and tomorrow will require, and that is digital literacy. It doesn't matter whether they are in the performing arts or in biotechnology or in medicine or engineering, they will need to be digitally literate. Digital literacy has different meanings in different contexts, but that, I think, is, is a fundamental necessity. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I'd like to, to pose a second question, uh, this time to Professor Scheel, and it's a, a practical question. Um, we've heard about a number of institutions today that are, are very large in scale and scope. How do you ensure a personal or small group experience? Sure, thank you for that question. It's uh, one of the things I think it's important. We, we do have very large universities and that creates some of the, the quite diverse opportunities that you've heard about from our colleagues today. But our fundamental teaching units are still very small. So in the arts and the humanities, the, the most common and the most deep interactions you have are in tutorial groups of 15 to 20 students. We have in the sciences still very much, and in engineering laboratory classes, where you might be in a group of 15 or 16 students, maybe in a big laboratory, but you'll have an individual um, a demonstrator or, or, or tutor in those classes. And so our fundamental model is no different to the model around the world. It's just that we happen to have uh, you know, larger groups of students in, 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 in maybe in lectures, but not necessarily in those small groups. And we also, you heard from some of our colleagues, uh, some of the colleagues today, a very strong focus on student accommodation, ensuring that students have access to all the, the different extracurricular activities on campus. And we in, have, we ha and uh, the other group of eight and, uh, other Australian universities have invested very heavily in physical spaces on campus. I ironically, um, you know, people thought that the, the coming of the digital age would see libraries become uh, unnecessary, but instead we're finding that the libraries are the most important uh, spaces on campus, and that students want to be on campus alongside other other students. And we, a typical experience I, I encounter is seeing uh, three or four students sitting around a laptop watching a lecture that's been video recorded together, so that they can stop it and discuss. So. Everything that we do and we design is designed to encourage that, it, that social experience of education, and we do that very much in small groups as well as large traditional lectures. Thank you very much for that answer. Mm. Um, I'd like to raise a, a couple of questions now about um, aspects of the university agenda that shape graduate outcomes. And if I could ask Professor Carlin, I'm interested in, in uh, finding out a little about um, uh, the university's policy on diversity and the policy and practice in diversity, how they shape the graduate attributes and outcomes at the University of Sydney? Well, thanks for that question. Um, I hope you got a sense uh, in, during my presentation of just how sort of deeply important that is. Uh, one of the things that I spend a fair bit of my time thinking about um, is how we can build cohorts of students in our various programs who genuinely bring that diversity um, to, um, to the table. Um, and that's important because we know that um, the learning environment in circumstances where you've got a sort of a homogenous culture, a very dominant or homogenous culture, is not going to be nearly as rich um, as in circumstances where uh, we've got a, a mix um, and we've got a gender balance as well. Um, and as we've seen, that's easier to fulfil in some disciplines than others. I think um, from Sydney's standpoint, uh, we have particular strategies um, relating to um, aspects of the way that we recruit students, but 
perhaps more strongly than that, um, some of our mobility um, programs, our exchange programs, our study abroad programs, which are directed specifically um, to building um, uh, that diversity in our student cohorts and where we target our, our um, activities in study abroad and exchange in particular to ensure that there's a balance there between local students, students who uh, come from this region, but also we want students from the US, um, students from Europe, uh, we want students from right around the world. So I think a big part of that is just building cohorts of students who come from different backgrounds, who come from different cultures. Uh, the other part of it is we've done a bit of work at the university, um, and I was describing this at a round table event here yesterday, in busting up the curriculum silos so that we have a much freer flow of our students um, across the traditional faculty boundaries. That also contributes exactly to this. So those, those are a couple of things that, um, that are part of what we're doing um, at Sydney. Thank you very much for that, Professor Cullen. Um, I might ask next uh, David Ward uh, a question on internationalisation. Um, and we've, uh, if uh, the Australian universities are home to some of the world's most internationalised classrooms, um, top Australian universities have active internationalisation programs, and I'd like to ask your views on what impact internationalisation programs, such as those that have been touched on by Professor Carlin, have on curriculum and how that might be reflected in graduate attributes and outcomes. So in terms of graduate attributes and outcomes, one of the things that we talk about in, in, in UNSW's graduate attributes is, is developing this notion of the global citizen. So a student who, who throughout their degree program has engaged you know, not just with UNSW but, but in fact with the world. Um, I mean, we've, we've seen today, and we've got three great examples in the room of, um, of exchange programs, which I know are you know, a very important part of all of the top universities in Australia, um, you know, very much the same at UNSW, and it's, it's something that we are committed as part of our 2025 strategy to, um, to trying to make more of those opportunities available, um, both for our students to go overseas, but also for uh, students from other countries to come to UNSW on exchange. So, so you know, that's, that's one key part of, of, of developing the global citizen. And the other is, is very much about um, the experience that our students get, both from each other and, and also from um, the staff that are teaching them. So in terms of the staff who are teaching them, well, you know, I've talked a little bit today around the diversity of our, of our, of our staffing population and, and, and the fact that um, you know, clo close to 50% of our staff come, come from countries other than Australia, so that, that brings a great um, set of multiple perspectives from, from right around the world. I mean, in terms of learning from each other and, and, and that sort of in the classroom experience, um, you know, we, we, we do emphasise at UNSW not just um, independent inquiry and critical thinking and, um, and, and, and creative thinking, but also that, that notion of collaborative in, inquiry. So students working together, learning from each other, but, but learning how to work in teams and um, you know, to participate together. Um, and again, that's where I think there's a very strong element of um, bringing those different perspectives from, from a very diverse cultural mix of, of, of students um, very much to the, to the fore in our, in our teaching programs. Thank you very much. Professor Scheel, um, I'd like to touch on research. Um, Australia's top universities have very extensive research programs, uh, working closely with industry on answers to problems in the real world. I'd like to know your views on how the research programs of your university, in particular through interaction with industry, shape graduate attributes and outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I think one of the important features of the, the universities that we've profiled and talked about today is that we're all committed to ensuring that our researchers, uh, our students interact with the researchers in, in a serious way 
Uh, and so, as Tyrone put it, uh, we don't hide our academics from students. So part of the academic experience and, and in a top research university, depending on the discipline, and this doesn't go across all disciplines, is that our academics are engaged with industry, identifying real world problems. And we, we saw that um, in uh, Professor Johnson's presentation around the various indus industries that are associated with W uh, University of Western Australia. So we try very much to give our students the exposure to the academics who themselves have been informed and are working with industry, and then we partner with them depending on the, on the field. So if you're in a health, uh, if you're studying in a health area, then uh, all of our students will experience something in, you know, that they will have to have done so, some sort of practicum. Similarly, in, in many of our business courses, there are, there are business practica where, they, where they're they're set problems by an industry partner and they work towards in, in teams towards solving them. And we do them as many Australian universities do those kind of research pr uh, business practica both in Australia and with international industry partners. And so, so some, some of it is about the environment being informed by the engagement with industry and by tackling those kind of problems. But uh, and some of it is direct exposure to the industry through research inter internships or, or, or practical in internships. So we have a whole range of, uh, of those opportunities and we're surrounded by uh, an ecosystem that encourages that. So, so, and we heard again about the various entrepreneurial type ecosystems and activities where we get business leaders in to engage with the students as well. So, and then on the, on the more formal research side, we have um, a range of programs and activities that encourage interactions between universities and researchers so that we uh, have joint research programs that typically have PhD students involved with those are graduate students, but often, uh, you know, there's there's uh, undergraduate research experiences associated with them as well. So there's a whole range of activities, but it's all premised around the fact that we have research that's focused on excellence and quality, but also in creating impact and value. Thank you very much for that. I have a question on innovation that I'd like to put to Professor Johnson, if I may. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in the view from the University of Western Australia on how universities, or how the University of Western Australia instills a capacity to seek and find innovation into their graduates. Um, I think most graduates, most students have some innovative capacity. And one of the things that we try to do across all our universities is provide opportunities to for students to realize uh, that capacity. And we do that in part through our standard um, curriculum structures and our teaching methods. And the method of teaching and, and academic engagement across most Australian universities in most subject areas is focused around some sort of problem-based learning. So, so the learning process is not about discovering an answer, it's about articulating, posing a really good question. Uh, and a really good question is so good it probably can't be answered, or at least not within the constraints of, of an undergraduate program. But knowing what is a good question, knowing how to address the question, is itself important. And then, across all our universities, we're doing a little bit more than that, because there are some students who are innately entrepreneurial. And uh, so in each of our universities, we have established structures that will allow students to develop their entrepreneurial um, interests. Um, at, uh, at the University of Western Australia, uh, we've supported students who have uh, established a not-for-profit organization called Bloom. And so they've set up the Bloom Lab, which is a student incubator, on enterprise incubator and startup and they provide support for each other. About 2,000 of our students have gone through Bloom courses. It's about how to pitch your idea, um, how to develop a business plan, how to make sure if you've got valuable intellectual property, it isn't entirely stolen from you by uh, investors, that you work with investors, not against them. A whole range of practical um, support structures, but the ideas have to come from the students. And 
my um, observation is that students have huge numbers of those ideas. We're very lucky in our universities uh, because we have the opportunity to work with students for them to achieve their goals. And very often, those goals are around uh, enterprise and innovation. Thank you very much for that. We have a, a very short amount of time left, and I wonder if we might ask if there are any questions which the audience might have for our panel members here this afternoon. Any questions anywhere? No? Richard, if, if there aren't, can I address one theme that I think is really important that we haven't really touched on today? Yes, Would that be all right? It's a three-letter word, fun. Now, we all talked about very serious things um, up here in our, in our own ways. Um, you know, one of the other things about, about Group of Eight universities is, apart from the fantastic learning, they're fun, right? Um, you don't want to forget that. Let, let me give you an example of this, because I'm sure that every one of us could give you our favourite examples of fun on campus. So we've got about 220 clubs and societies at Sydney. I've lost count. Um, my favourite one is the Chocolate Appreciation Society, um, which in Orientation Week every year has a huge queue because they give out free chocolate, so note that. But whether it's sport or music or drama or crazy things, there's a lot of things going on in these universities outside the classroom. And it, I think it'd be regrettable if we didn't kind of touch on that a little bit today, because what goes on outside of the classroom and the capacity to play a sport or play an instrument or meet friends and do drama or do things that aren't your academic things are really important. And at least at Sydney, we've got a lot of evidence that says that students who engage in these, in these activities outside of the classroom are happier, are learning more, are making more friends, better networks, and they're performing academically better. And best of all, when they finish, they've got much more interesting things to say to prospective employers. So I, let's never forget fun, would be my little thing to say there. Well, thank you very much, Professor Carlin. All right, well, thank you. I'd like to thank the panel very sincerely for their time today. And I think we could all thank each of you. Thank you very much to Professor Margaret Scheel. <laughs> Professor Paul Johnson. <laughs> Mr. David Ward. <laughs> and Professor Tyrone Carlin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.